Ladies and gentlemen, our guest today is none other than Lynn Ulbricht. It is a uh, it is a great honor to have her on again, and I, I'll I'll just start by saying that I came up with a nickname for Lynn, and <laughs> yeah. I, I I don't think it stuck, but I stand by it, and it really should have. The patron the patron saint of activist mothers. What what Lynn has done <laughs> as the mother of Ross Ulbricht uh, in in becoming an activist herself. It, it's just it's it's. It, it, for those who don't know, Ross Ulbricht is serving two consecutive life sentences for the alleged creation of the Silk Road and has been through so much over, I mean, I don't even know how long. I guess I, in order for me to put it on my own timeline, I'd have to think back to 2011 when I myself was spending all my $5 Bitcoins on the Silk Road that I wish I could now be donating to Ross's legal defense instead at what, you know, $10,000 a pop. Uh, but what Ross Ulbricht did, and I'll say one more thing to set, to set him up here. Uh, someone, in, 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 one of the government agents in, in, involved in the setup of Ross um, tried to spin this into a, a murder mystery. And Lynn's retort to that was the real murder mystery is here when Ross Ulbricht was providing a way for people to get medicine to children with CBD, who needed CBD to prevent seizure disorder, and they couldn't get it legally any other way. Why would government agents want to take that away? How many people have died? And it might not be that many around the margins, but certainly a huge quality of life reduction has resulted from the shutting down of the Silk Road, this beautiful mechanism that existed for people to be able to sell illegal drugs anonymously in a way where they were held accountable to their reputation in a proper market setting. And the story of the railroading of Ross Ulbricht is one of the history books. And to know that, that Lynn Ulbricht, his mother, has done everything she has for him since then is just, it, it gives me so much faith in humanity. And as someone who's been to jail and had my family behind me, myself as an activist, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I can't tell you what it's got. I mean, I, I, even for me, it's, it's, it's still, it's hard to fathom for someone in Ross's situation who's going four gray walls, this might be the rest of my life, but I got my mom fighting for me on the outside. What a difference that would make to just have four gray walls and, and nobody fighting for you like Lynn is. Lynn, it, it's, I, I hope that that it does justice. If there's anything I've, I've missed in the introduction, please let me know. Um, I, I'd like to, to give you the platform for an hour and hope that at least somewhere in here we can get, a, get, get caught up on Ross's current situation and what people can do to help. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much. It's a great intro. Um, can you hear me okay, Adam? Lima Charlie, thank you. You can hear me. Um, and uh, I want to say I have quoted your title of me proudly. Well, you know, the patron saint of uh, activist mothers. And, uh, you know, so I have I have held on to that. I think you gave that to me in Anarchapulco one year. But, um, and also as far as the early Bitcoins, you know, I asked Ross, I said, he was telling me all about it. He was so excited. I mean, this is before, you know, everything happened. And I said, so should I get some? And he goes, no, mom, it's too volatile. And I'm yeah. like, okay, that was the worst financial advice I've ever gotten. Uh, no, it's probably like 50 cents. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, but anyway, uh, thank you. Yeah, it's been, a, you know, a long, Ross just started his eighth year in prison on October 1st. Oh, so he yeah. just is go now going into his eighth year. And um, <laughs> since March, because of COVID uh, and then the riots, he's been in a metal box essentially um, 22 hours a day with a two hour break. And then with the riots, they locked it down for 24 hours a day for almost a month. So, and he's fed through a slot in the door. You know, this is a person who's never inflicted any kind of bodily harm, violence, anything at all on anyone. And uh, so, yeah, and now just lately, thankfully, he gets out one hour a week. So maybe hopefully he'll get some uh, vitamin D and yeah. um, some break and then uh, is more out of his, his box. But it's been a long, tough road in general. Prison's no cakewalk, as you know. And uh, so, yeah, and I just keep, I just cannot rest until he's out of there, you know? and that he can meet you and so many people and just celebrate 
being free and, uh, and work for that and work for criminal justice reform and, and really be someone who can be a force for good in the world. And um, so, yeah, so I, I can keep, keep on keeping on, you know, there's not, you know, when you're a mom or a parent or, or a relative, I mean, many people have their siblings fighting for them, you know, people who care about you, they love you. It's really hard to just go, ah, oh, well, I'll just get on with my life. I'll pursue my bliss, big deal. I can't. Not that I don't have good moments and not that I don't have fun and, and try to enjoy things. I mean, and Ross wants me to, keeps you stronger, but that's different from, I just keep my eye on that prize of, of Ross being out. So, yeah. And I've had so much help, by the way, I wanna say from you, from other uh, Liberty lovers, from people in the uh, crypto space. I mean, to have just really walked beside us and made it possible for me to be, be still at it. You know, it's it's not, easy to do alone and I don't feel alone. I feel like I have real friends. And um, that's been the silver lining and um, it's been really good, you know, wonderful to have that. Well, I, I appreciate the nod there to my time, oh, yeah. but I did four months and mm -hmm. it was, I mean, I, I, as I said earlier in the show today, it's not even the same, it's, it's, it's a t when you go to jail or prison and you know you can you can make tick marks on the wall and eventually it's going to be over it's not the same experience as you make tick mark tick marks on the wall and you don't know if you're going to die in that box mm -hmm. I, like even even as pe people look at me and go, oh well, Adam, yeah, you got to be able to sympathize, right? You did time as an activist, and I, I did two months in solitary, and even that wasn't as bad as the specific conditions that Ross is experiencing right now. And this is a a whole other crazy case in which I I mean I, I hate to 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 in any way diminish our our actual love and appreciation for Ross and and for you. But there's got to be a bigger public self-interest motivation here, people. Like, you see this happen, you know. So m maybe before we get into his legal situation, Lynn, for people who aren't familiar with the case or, or maybe don't see the, the idea of this as a kind of dangerous precedent, why should the average American be fighting for Ross out of their own self-interest? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I, I totally agree with that. It's definitely in our self-interest to preserve our freedoms and our constitutional protections. And um, just the fact that a young, nonviolent, first-time offender could be given a death sentence, really, a walking death sentence, death in prison sentence, no, no parole, no chance to, you know, you know, he's matured, he's 10 years older now, no, no chance to, um, of any hope for nonviolent uh, actions is not American. It is not uh, in tune with our values whatsoever. It's really weaponizing the criminal justice system against him and thousands and thousands of other people. And, you know, I, I say this to, you know, liberty loving people all the time is that what is a more fundamental violation of your freedom than being put in a metal box? I mean, you know, that's pretty basic. You know, we can talk about I've lost my freedom with this thing or that thing, or, you know, there's lots of ways we're losing our freedoms. But this is a fundamental, basic freedom that you're in a cage and you're going to die in there. And um, everyone should be concerned. That kind of draconian sentence puts us all in peril. And the fact that that can happen in this country is alarming. And um, so, yeah, it's not just about Ross. We have a bill of rights in our constitution that was violated in his case over and over again. His fir the first amendment was violated when the judge said, I know, we know that you started this site for philosophical reasons, admitting that he started it for a philosophy, a voluntary interaction and um, non-aggression principle and the freedom for people to exchange what they wanted as long as it didn't hurt a third party. She's admitting it at sentencing that she knows that's why he did it, not to be a kingpin, not to exploit people, not to hurt people, 
And yet she, she, so basically she's saying that philosophy is so dangerous and troubling, and those are her words, that I have to make sure you die in a cage, that you can't get out and discuss this philosophy. We live in America. <laughs> you know, we're supposed to have freedom mm -hmm. of speech. We're not supposed to be incarcerated for our lifetime based on our philosophy. That's the First Amendment. The, um, then there's the Fourth Amendment. And this went all the way to the Supreme Court in Ross's case, where um, uh, the government essentially, what was upheld, at, and we're not protected, is that the government, without a warrant, without probable cause, without oversight, in secret, can legally, because of what hasn't been overturned, go into any of our internet traffic, scarf up whatever they want, use it however they want, and no one will know. They can use it to blackmail their enemies. They can use it to pursue enemies. It has, you know, all kinds of relevant information like, you know, sexual orientation, religious affiliation, um, medical records, political persuasions, all kinds of things. And this is a, um, it was based, this kind of loophole, it's called the third party doctrine, was based on the dial telephone. Well, the dial telephone was about one phone number that you dialed. Now phones are little computers that have all kinds of relevant information and the law has not caught up with our rights. That's the fourth amendment. In this case, this was, is what happened with Ross. Then there's the uh, sixth amendment, which was written to protect the accused from rogue judges and prosecutors who don't go by what a jury rules, but why they, what they think is true. So in this case, the judge, took uncharged allegations from the prosecution and uh, one of them being murder, that Ross planned murder for hire, which he's always denied. They have no proof of it. It's all based on anonymous chats. And she used it to justify this draconian sentence. That is, a, and this went all the way to the Supreme Court too. And she, and uh, you know, they punted it. But this is a problem that apparently has been going on in our country for a long time where the um, people who are not charged or are even acquitted are still put in prison for something because a judge decides, no, I don't, I don't care about what the jury says or if a jury said anything, I'm gonna do this. Well, this is completely in violation of our Bill of Rights. And then there's the Eighth Amendment, which prohibits cruel and unusual punishment. Um, if this isn't cruel oh, and unusual, I don't know what is, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was allegedly prevents, uh, not very effective in doing so apparently. Uh, but but yeah, Lynn, before we get to the, the back to the current situation with this. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was the weaponizing of the state. And, and mm -hmm. a lot of us might think of this as a sort of, you know, they, they want to make an example out of him mm -hmm. where it's, you know, get in line or else. If, if you're, and we've criminalized, so the government has criminalized so much normal behavior. Mm -hmm. If they don't like you, if you, if you challenge authority, you're going to get, you're going to get in trouble. But that's, that's not actually really accurate and, and in the libertarian community those are the stories that we see activists gets taken advantage of ripped off used as an excuse for the state to, to whatever but there are a lot of other horror stories that we don't hear about of just random people being victimized by government agents because they have money or something they want and and i know uh you know even down to the sick personal level we've seen cops go after you know, boyfriends of exes and crazy shit like that and get away with it because they are state agents. And in this case, this was a, a sort of later development in Ross's story. But can you tell us at least briefly the story of the agents involved who were trying to profit from this case? Yeah, sure. Um, what's most appalling about them is that the judge wouldn't allow the jury to know about them. <laughs> so here we have these two corrupt agents and it's all put, laid out in detail on our website where it says the real and untold story. And you can listen to it as a podcast, watch it as a video or um, read it. And it's foot, heavily footnoted. It's based on the public record. Pretty riveting stuff, actually. But in any case, um, these guys, the judge knew, the prosecution, of course, knew. And of course, the defense wanted them to be the jury to know about the fact that there were two corrupt agents who had 
unfettered access to Silk Road. They could act as various aliases, including Dread Pirate Roberts, which was the, the lead administrator that supposedly Ross was the only one of those. And uh, they could act as Dread Pirate Roberts and do right. whatever, say whatever they wanted. Yeah, let, let, me, let me go back. For people who aren't familiar with this story, I think there's one thing I have to interrupt just to, yeah. to make perfectly yeah, I clear. I can give an that. overview if you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, no, just, just the mm -hmm. thing about the identity that... that that Ross Ulbricht was allegedly operating under the code name as the administrator Dread Pirate Roberts on the website The Silk Road. And in the course of the investigation, other agents were able to get into that account and post in that name. I'm sorry to have to interrupt, but I really got to no, understand no, that. Mm -hmm. For people who don't know this, is that a cop, if they see you doing something they don't like, can then somehow even on Facebook, possibly, and this is way more complicated with the Silk Road, obviously, but they can get into your account and say something in your name and then you be held legally liable for that. That's, yep. I mean, the, the whole, the whole precedent of that should scare everybody. And, and it's, really? it's not just libertarians. It's anybody who refuses to be a victim of the state or an individual officer says, I want what that person has. Oh well, yeah. Whatever they for, for whatever motivation. And actually, after, um, so these people were not allowed to be known to the jury or mentioned at trial, yet after the trial, the defense team kept digging because what they do is they pile on so much material that it's not humanly possible to find every needle in that haystack. But over time they did, and it came out that DPR, whoever that person was, signed into the Silk Road from that account when Ross had been in solitary for seven weeks. There's no way that was Ross. So it's like, well, who was that? You know, it's like, there's so many unanswered questions. And, uh, but in any case, these, these agents, all their emails were never unencrypted. They have all these encrypted emails about them, won't un unencrypt them. There's all the sealed evidence, undisclosed evidence. The government is not interested in revealing the full story with these guys, obviously. And um, so they used a back door through um, a high level admin, Curtis Green, and who was busted and um, got in, they stole hundreds of thousands of dollars from vendors and they had the ability to change chats, all kinds of evidence that was used as evidence, chats um, uh, in, in on the marketplace, in the forum, all kinds, say anything, do anything, pretty much free reign. And this was not allowed to be known to the jury. And since then, Curtis Green has come out and said, because he's all involved in the, the, the supposed murder for hire that I personally think was a complete setup and con concocted by the agents and that there was no, but other people think there was somebody, he doesn't think it was Ross. Let's just put it that way. Curtis is sure. It wasn't Ross. He has said it publicly. He wants to meet him, have him over for dinner. That he and his wife both, he's afraid of these corrupt agents getting out. That's who he's afraid of. And I'm quoting him. He said it in public. And he's very supportive of Ross. How many, how many supposed murder victims say this about su their supposed would-be killer? I mean, he knows it. You know, it's 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 one of these things that they typically, and apparently it's done a lot. I didn't know this before I got into this whole thing. Um, they'll say murder for hire or whatever it is and not prove it, but it smears the person. It, it prejudices the jury and they're like, oh, he's really bad, but they never have to prove it. And they never have proven this. And actually there was an indictment in Maryland um, that said it, and they've dismissed that with prejudice. It is no, nowhere in the legal system is there this accusation anymore. So, well, all of Ross's convictions are nonviolent. So the the agents are in prison. I think one of them actually might be out by now, and the other one's got a couple more years. Um, and uh, they have tainted, especially one of them, Sean Bridges, has tainted many cases. And in fact, many of them have been thrown out because of his involvement. Not not Ross's though. And um, so yeah, and they were. Those are the corrupt agents we know about. Exactly. I think there's at least a, another one, and a lot of people do, who got went. In, oh, so that's another thing that happened. So oh, we saw DPR log in after um, Ross was in prison, but also there was a file discovered that proved that someone had gone in there, a high level person, we think it's another corrupt agent, and deleted 
a bunch of relevant information that would have helped Ross. And that was the evidence the jury saw. And then we found this folder that showed all this other stuff, but it was too late. The, the trial was over and we haven't been able to get a new trial. So there's lots of speculation that there's at least a third agent. And I think that's pretty, I do. I think so. So I, I think there's a lot of money involved, you know, there's a lot of money involved. And uh, on Silk Road, there was, you know, it was a, a, a lot of money <laughs> and that attracts all of that stuff. So, And, and just as a modern and, and uh, you know, a, a, a new kind of, you know, realm of operations of human behavior, even for us to wrap our heads around, I, I think it might help to kind of to understand this. It's like if, if you get if you get busted with a baggie of weed. And, you know, it was actually, well, you had two baggies because you were saving some for later. Well, now they're going to hit you with intent to distribute, mm. you know, and they go and you go, oh, that's bullshit. That's not fair. And and it's sort of like, well, now they'll negotiate down from that and they'll get you to submit to a lesser charge. Mm -hmm. And I, I know that sounds unrelated, but now think about that in Ross's realm. Well, you were facilitating drug sales. Well, because it's in the digital realm and all we have to do is fabricate one message and next thing you know, we get to steal $820,000. Let's just tack on murder for hire and then we can at least be sure, you know, we'll, we'll also get this you know, life sentence guaranteed and you'll never threaten us again. I mean, just it, it, it's when, when you take these, nor these normal, currently normal, evil, corrupt police practices of trumped up charges and bullying, and, and exploiting people that they have the opportunity to under color of law, when it moves into this digital realm, it has some scary distortions and the reality resulting is life in prison. So uh, you mentioned the possibility of, of a retrial. Is, is that where the focus of your effort is now? No, but let me just address what you just said because you made a really good point. Before this trial, um, digital evidence was not considered solid. It's might way too easy to fake, uh, delete, um, you know, t tamper with and present a whole new thing. You really only need Photoshop if you want to get fancy. You don't need much. And um, like the murder for hire stuff was all anonymous chats. Anybody can put that up, right? So it, digital evidence was not allowed. This judge has made it a precedent that it is. So we are all more in danger because of that. Because honestly, what's to stop somebody, prosecutor, whatever, from saying, oh no, this was here, but we'll put it up on the screen. Hey, look, jury, it's on a screen. So it must be real. I mean, that's basically what happened. It's on the screen. You know, everybody's like, okay, all right, got it. It's convincing. And uh, it's easily, easily fabricated. And so it's a dangerous precedent that we all should be concerned about. Um, you said something else that was really good. I can't remember if I think. Well, it's, it's funny <laughs> earlier, just kind of unrelated. I was, you know, you know, quoting Ernie Hancock, <laughs> nothing on the internet is real. But now I would say, especially stuff the government is accusing you of. But yeah, it's. It, yeah. Oh, I know. Yeah. yeah. And also you mentioned how people, and I know people who said they've pled, they've pled to things they didn't do, including Curtis Green, because they threatened their family. They threatened yep. them. They said, so 98% of people accused of a crime plea. Now that just knowing that a number, you sh it's obvious some innocent people are going to, to prison. It's just too big a number. And out, if you do, they tell you, well, if you go to trial, you're gonna pay the price and you do, and you are gonna be given a what much worse sentence uh, and punishment if you go. And so most people go, I don't wanna take the chance. And so prosecutors threaten them, they bully them and they go, okay, okay, okay. Is this how our justice system should work in the United States? Is this is America? And it's like, no, this is um, the prosecutors running the show in these courtrooms. And um, yeah, and if you do go to trial like Ross did, uh, yeah, you get you get terrible results if you don't win, and you're probably not going to win. This deck is stacked against you. I saw that myself with his trial. So this is not good. <laughs> So what's the current push right now? What are you hoping to happen legally to free Roth? Well, we're, we've really exhausted um, the appeals in the court. Uh, you, get, you can't go higher than the Supreme Court. And um, 
they chose not to address the fourth and sixth amendment violations in the case. And so you can't go back. That's it on the Supreme Court. There is a thing called a habeas petition that we have, but it's been very slowed down by COVID. And then the other, and that could, might be, it probably won't be a new trial. It could be a resentencing. I, I don't know. It's very hard to win. Doesn't mean we can't, but you're going to try everything. But um, it, statistically, it's very difficult. And um, the other thing is a, a presidential pardon. That mm. can free him. And um, we have wonderful support from so many libertarians, including um, Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen and the, you know, uh, chair of the party, Nick Sarwark and the executive director, Dan Fishman, but also and that the Libertarian Party itself, who, who passed a motion unanimously. And I'm like, oh, the Libertarians did something unanimously. This yeah, is pretty right. cool. You know? And um, yeah, to, we want clemency for Ross Ulbricht. This was two years ago and they've been great. And, um, you know, because Libertarians understand that Ross's motivation, they understand where he's coming from. They know that, you know, of all the garbage that's said about him is garbage and uh, that's negative and, and that he's, you know, this kingpin thug, you know, I mean, Hey, kingpins get way less time than Ross. El Chapo got half the sentence that Ross got. This is El Chapo, who's, you know, how many people died because of El Chapo. And yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah. So, you know, Trump has gone on uh, television and said that he he leans libertarian, that he sympathizes with libertarian thought. And I'm just hopeful that someone can let him understand the injustice here. D and Donald that, Trump has said a lot of things. I know, but you know, he's the one that can get, he, he is the person right now who had, can, with a signature, free Ross. Yeah. No, this puts you in the really unfortunate position of not being able to say anything mean about Cheeto Jesus or Cadet Bone Spurs or uh, any, any of the other nice words we'd apply to Donald Trump. But no, it, it is interesting to think, you know, to be able to, 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 to be in that position to say, could we, could we call Trump? Could we actually get Trump's attention on on this one case? I mean, has he ever been asked uh, a question about Ross point blank? Um, I've been told he has not a question um, more told about Ross, but um, I'm not really sure um, exactly what, you know, he's absorbed and, and he's pretty busy. But um, I, I'm, I am hopeful. Um, I think that it's, you know, it's such an egregious case and it's so um, wrong that, you know, you know, look, we need to, I feel like Trump deserves some credit. He's, he pushed through that first step act and um, against the will of his Republican colleagues. And that's first step act to help a lot of people. And now there's a second step act We're you know, we're slowly trying to reform this hideous situation with the criminal justice system. And he's really been, he's pardoned people. I, I assume he'll pardon more people. And, um, you know, I think it's good to give people credit where credit is due. You might not agree with everything, but you know, he did. And um, I know people personally who benefited from it. And he wanted to, well, what happened with the, with the First Step Act is there's a hideous, horrible uh, law that are, is part of the 1994 crime bill that Joe Biden wrote along with Bill Clinton. And it has something called the Third Strike Act or the Third Strike, Third Strike You're Out thing, policy. And what it means is it, it used to be that your third strike was life, automatic life. Now, Ross went to, was, before he is where he is now, he was in a very violent prison. It was a step down from the supermax. And he knew a lot of people doing life, including a guy doing life for marijuana in Colorado. But it's marijuana at the federal level in Colorado. And this guy, Tony, is doing life. I mean, this is really, really bad. But in any case, and, and actually Ross published a picture. It's on our website um, of him with other fellow uh, drug offender serving life. And um, anyway, uh, it's uh, on our website, freeross.org, which I invite everybody to go to. And I think it's on the about page if you want to pull it up. But in any case, it's a great picture because it shows these people. And one of them, 
he, they were dancing for joy because first step back passed and um, there should be an about page on there like uh, over a little bit. But anyway, um, first step back passed. Um, so he had already done about 18 years and first step back said 25 years instead of life. And then they found out it wasn't retroactive because of pushback in Congress. So that's like saying, so then he's looking at life again. And I'll, but if you, so basically if you did your third strike now, you, you'd be automatic 25 years. But because it was before the first step back, he still has life. It's like saying, well, slavery's bad, so we're gonna end it, but oh, you're still a slave. So sorry, you were a slave before we freed the slave. So you gotta stay one. That's really what it's saying. It's, it's bizarre yeah. and it's terrible. So, but you know, he, that's not Trump. Trump was trying to get it through, you know, without being, and being retroactive. So, you know, I, I, I feel like he might, he's a heart for that, or at least he sees the justice of it. And um, his son-in-law's, uh, Jared Kushner's father was in prison mm -hmm. uh, and he's a big advocate of criminal justice reform. And so, you know, I feel like, you know, you just got to keep, keep on keeping on. And, well, there's, there's a bigger challenge if it, if it when it comes to appealing to Trump, assuming he is a populist, you have to make it popular to free Ross. Mm -hmm. and this is why the bigger PR war mm -hmm. is still it, it, it might be what is most ultimately relevant. Is it can we make it popular for president mm -hmm. to free Ross? And I, and I hate to suggest this absurd metric of success but if if we had been so successful in telling ross's story and getting the average american to support him that uh donald trump would have thought it was in his best interest for re-election to have pardoned ross or, or or something before the election it would have been done by now but there's been a huge effort to demonize him as well that makes it almost impossible for a president to say, oh yeah, free Ross, that'll make me more popular. I, I, I know we've, we've dealt with some of this behind the scenes, but, uh, and, and I'll just tell the audience on, on that count that there is, um, you know, not just the, aside from the casual entertainment industry effort to take this story and, and make it a sensationalist movie, there is a, truly concerted, deliberate smear campaign against Ross. And maybe it's done. Maybe they think they've got him, you know, blacklisted enough in the, in the, with the public already. But um, what do you think the worst of that has been? Well, um, first, let me say, we have over 350,000 signatures on change.org asking the president to um, you know, give Ross clemency and commute his sentence. That's a fair amount of people. Three hundred. It's more than that. It's more than three hundred and fifty. And um, we have a lot of leaders who are listed on our site who have written letters, who have spoken out. These are, you know, somewhat prominent people, and who, you know, may be able to make a good case. Um, yes, he's been demonized in the mainstream media. He's not in the mainstream media much, you know, anymore. It's kind of an old story, and most. I, I'm sure I could go around in any town in the United States and they wouldn't, most people wouldn't even know who Ross is. Some might, you know, one or two might. I don't think it's that much in, in the public view. I mean, there's so much going on right now. <laughs> I don't, but um, no, I, I, you know, having that petition as a PR tool, but as far as the worst, well, I mean, you know, this whole murder for hire. And of course you and I know there was a piece of garbage movie that was being made. Uh, it didn't get to air yet because COVID shut down all the film festivals. So uh, I'm out on that deal. But, you know, could. There's a CBS series coming out about the FBI, I guess, to try to save their reputation. I don't know. And it's a whole series. And one of the episodes is about Ross. And I refuse to be in it because I'm like, I've been burned so many times by the mainstream media, distorting it and sensationalizing the story but I can just imagine what they're going to say. And um, I don't know if anybody watches CBS anymore, <laughs> you know, but uh, you know, that's not great. It's a big company. And um, you know, just keep, but you got to just keep going and hoping, see, I'm hoping to, you know, connect with people who are close to the president or his, or his 
you know, people who are in the criminal justice reform movement who, you know, sympathize and, and there are many of them and they have spoken out. Um, so you just, you know, what are you going to do? You just keep going and, and praying and keeping my eye on the prize of Ross's freedom. And if anybody out there knows anyone, you know, that has political connections of any kind, um, please let me know. You can go to freeross.org and in the footer of every page, you can see where to contact me. It's real easy. And, um, you know, any help would be terrific. And of course, well, my, you, you and Ernie and, and so many of you know, my good friends in this movement have been, have been great. There's the picture. If you can scroll down a little, see that up. I mean, sorry, not down, up, 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 up a little bit. Just about, well, that's Ron Paul with Ross in the lower picture right here. He brought Ron Paul to state college back when he was in college, uh, grad school and um, worked in his campaign. And the one on the upper left, if you click it, it's a big um, picture of him with the nonviolent drug offenders that are serving life in, in Florence. There you go. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. Ross on the bottom. Uh, the guy, Tony, who's serving life for marijuana is third from the left standing. The guy, Jay, who's on the far right, is the one that, you know, thought he was getting out because it was, you know, uh, we thought that first step wasn't retroactive. The fellow right below him is Jose, sweetest guy ever. I met him. I've met his sister. I've met many or interacted with many of their families. And, you know, these are people, they're not violent, you know. And the guy, Sean, up on the upper left, he got caught with user amounts of heroin. It was his third strike. He's not a dealer. He's got a problem. He's an addict, you know, and they gave him life because it's the third strike. I mean, this this third strike law has put thousands and thousands of people in cages. It's a terrible, terrible thing. And, they, and I'm glad at least that Trump was able to push through the first step back. And it was a struggle, but at least going forward and maybe they'll make it so it's retroactive eventually, um, at least going forward, you know, people won't get life for making a mistake, you know, like being an addict. Or making a statement. Yes. Or making, a, having a philosophy. <laughs> well, Ross's wasn't his first, third strike, but yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, Lynn, you know, you can always count on me. Of course you've got I my number. That. I, I love hearing Absolutely. from you anytime you have something Thank to you. promote. Um, anytime we're, we're doing another round of promotion. Oh, there's one of, yeah, this is Ross's artwork. That's, uh, I just went down there. It's in um, Soho. No, that one's in, yeah, that one's in Soho. It's like painted on the a building and Ross did the artwork and then they copied it and painted it on a building in Soho. It's really cool. And there's a, a billboard in Times Square and there's um, another one in Brooklyn Navy Yard around New York stuff. Yeah. So that, I went around New York with the person who financed it and we went around and I got to see them all. It's really neat. And um so, but no, I know I can, Adam, and I hope to see you in uh, Arizona. Love Arizona. And um, yeah, I've really appreciated your support, Ernie's, all, you know, all our friends. And um, it's been the silver lining of this nightmare, really, to meet all of you people, such good people. Yeah, so, well, as, as much as it is a nightmare and as much as I hate this story, I love that it represents an opportunity to celebrate someone as a real hero. And I think the, the more uh, we can make Ross an icon, uh, the better off humanity is. The more people know his story, the more people know his face, his name. The, not only is it more likely for him to be free, but for America and really humanity to, to learn the lessons of his story. So Lynn, uh, aside from going to freeross.org and, and signing the petition, uh, what can people do to help and, and connect with you? And is there anything else we yeah. need to cover today? Um, no, I, I think we covered a lot. Um, I would say, you know, again, if you have any connections politically or any other way that you think would be valuable, please get a hold of me. Of course, we always need um, donations too. And um, really help us on social media. Um, you know, there's still a lot of trolls out there and a lot of misinformation. So if you go to freeross.org and learn a little bit, um, you'll you'll be able to help defend us because sometimes we're you know battling these people who are so full of misinformation because they just get it from the mainstream media and i don't believe anything they say anymore after my exp personal experience i mean they just echo each other with a bunch of misinformation i'm sure you know that so yeah, um, yeah so any of that any there's a take action page on our website that has some suggestions but a, a lot of times like the guy with the billboard he just came up with his own idea 
So, you know, yeah, I, I'm just me and our family and, and some, you know, steadfast friends and supporters, very small. People go, hey, you know, how's you get your team? I'm like, my team? Where is my team? <laughs> <laughs> no, I have, I do have help, but it's not, not we're small, very, very small. We can always use help. So, um, yeah, um, any of that, just uh, get in touch with me and, yeah. And uh, thanks for all your good work, Adam. And, you know, you're keeping the whole subject of liberty going. And, you know, it's a it's a it's a challenge these days. Right. Well, Lynn, I think more than a team, you have a movement behind you as, as well. You should in this effort. So thank you for yeah. stepping up and, and truly Absolutely. deserving the title, the patron saint of <laughs> activist mothers. Yes. Lynn Albrecht, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Adam. <laughs>